At this point, I'm really excited for how well HBO seems to be handling Westeros since the, shall we say, less than ideal finish to A Game of Thrones. And it's not just that season 1 of House of the Dragon was really good and that the season 2 trailers have me very hyped, which it was, and they do, and we'll talk about that a little later, it's also some things that have been rumored to be happening behind the scenes, as well as some of the shows that they've chosen not to go forward with that all has me very excited for how seriously they're taking this universe. So I'm going to avoid spoilers for this video, but we are going to be talking about several shows that they have greenlit and several shows that they've cancelled, and I'm basically going to make the argument that they're 5 for 5 on their decision making so far. In addition to this, I'm going to talk about a decision that was made behind the scenes at HBO that has me very confident that we're going to be getting some good Westerosi content for years to come. And then at the very end, I'm going to explain what I think HBO's master plan might be for all of this. At least it's what I would do if I was in charge, so stay tuned for that, and let's get started. I think the place to start is that bit of behind-the-scenes information that has me feeling really confident about the future of Westerosi content, and this comes from a video that was put out a couple weeks ago by The Dragon Demands. For those of you who aren't subscribed to The Dragon Demands, they cover a lot of like behind-the-scenes information and things like that, so if you really want to avoid spoilers, you should probably avoid the channel, but if you don't really care about that, they're a very good source for a lot of information. I'm going to have the video that I'm talking about now linked as one of the end cards to this video if you want to get more information on the topic that I'm about to cover, but basically what they explain is that the failure of the last couple of seasons of Game of Thrones and the failure of the Long Night prequel, which they sunk a bunch of money into and eventually had to cancel, is the thing that got them to realize, hey, maybe we should start listening to George R. R. Martin when we're making content and spin-offs in Westeros. Now, that may seem like a very obvious decision to make, but if you know anything about the behind the scenes and the little rift sort of between George and D&D &D in the later seasons of Game of Thrones, you'll know that they were not listening to George R. R. Martin and they weren't taking a lot of his ideas seriously. I do think that the show showed us a lot of the endpoints for his character's stories, but all of the lore and a lot of the magic and the themes were all pretty much abandoned. The fact that the later seasons of Game of Thrones were received so poorly amongst the fandom, and the fact that the Long Night prequel, which they went ahead with without George R. R. Martin, basically, he said that they should do House of the Dragon and then Dunk an Egg, and they said, nah, we're gonna try the Long Night, and then they ended up wasting millions and millions of dollars on what turned out to be a disaster. This one-two punch is basically the thing that got them to sit down and go, okay, maybe George actually knows what he's talking about, and that's how we got House of the Dragon, which George is deeply involved with the lore for, and he's been in full contact with the showrunners. Now, we don't need to go into details too much, but basically it does sound like the Long Night prequel, which they cancelled, was basically just fan fiction that they were trying to set in Westeros. They were really not consulting with George at all, and they seemed to be making some pretty major changes to the world building and the story, and all of that just doesn't really make any sense to me. If you have a well-established fantasy setting like Westeros, and people really do seem to care about the lore and the history, and you just decide to go against all of that for no reason, I just don't understand that decision. Like, I kind of understood what happened with, say, the Rings of Power, where they couldn't get the rights to do all of the full, like, lore and things like that that were written out by Tolkien, but HBO has the ability to do a bunch of stuff that's written by Martin, so the fact that they would basically set, like, a fan fiction in his universe while he's still there and they could work with him just never made any sense to me, so I'm pretty glad that they ended up canceling The Long Night Show. Other channels like The Dragon Demands have full videos going into all the details about just how much of a train wreck it seems like The Long Night was behind the scenes, but basically they seem to be making some pretty serious changes to the historical timeline to tell a story that they found more interesting, and they seem to be making some serious changes to the lore and world building, like, for example, one of the more wild changes that got a bunch of headlines was they were apparently going to make the children of the forest just be black people who ended up being cursed by some sort of crazy magic, and that's just nothing like the world building that George has set up. The children of the forest are basically fairies or elves or something like that that were there before the West Westerosi came over, so making them just be black people who ended up getting cursed just goes completely against the lore and the world building, and it seems like if you want to tell that story, right, like if you want to tell a story similar to that, or you need to change the timeline and the world building to tell this story, why not just do it in a different fantasy universe, like make your own universe, don't completely ruin the world building and lore for one that many people care about and already has an established history. 
I would hope personally that one of the lessons that these big networks are learning from the failure of the end of Game of Thrones and the somewhat negative reception that Rings of Power has gotten is that, hey, if you have an established world, that's one of the things that people really, really like and they really care that you take the lore seriously. Like, sure, you're going to have the casual fans who aren't ever going to dive, like, fully deep into all of this stuff, but you do want them to be able to turn to their friends who have read the books or who have dove deeply into all of this stuff and then ask them questions and their friends can answer them and you can have people theorizing and know that it's worth it to theorize about what's going on because the people making the stuff are taking it seriously. And that's what creates water cooler talk, that's what creates something that's worth engaging in as a fan. So the fact that they're now working closer with George R.R. Martin for their properties going forward is a good sign that they're starting to take the lore seriously. So apparently when they originally asked George R.R. R. Martin, what spin-offs should we do in Westeros, his answer was, as I said, House of the Dragon and Dunk and Egg. We're obviously approaching Season 2 of House of the Dragon now, and Dunk and Egg has just been greenlit. So basically, with the cancelling of the Long Night prequel, and the green lighting of those two series, I think that's 3 for 3 on HBO making the correct call. Over the winter I got to chat with a friend who I've talked about the A Song of Ice and Fire books with for years, when Game of Thrones was airing we would go over to each other's house to watch, we'd have like big watch parties and things like that, and we actually would have like serious in-depth conversation about where we think things are going. And when I talked to him about House of the Dragon, he said he hadn't watched season 1, and he was still too hurt from how terrible the end of Game of Thrones was to get into it. It was very nice to be able to actually just fully honestly say, hey, no, House of the Dragon is really good, you should get into it, like it's worth getting back into the universe for. I fully plan to follow up that pitch now that season 2 is getting closer and say, hey, if you haven't checked it out yet, you really should get into it and watch season 1 before season 2 gets ready to start airing. I had made the same pitch to another friend who hadn't read all the books but watched Game of Thrones and was also disappointed by the ending, and they hadn't watched season 1 of House of the Dragon, but since I pitched it to them, they actually binged the whole thing over the winter, and when I caught up with them recently, they said they really enjoyed it. Like, I don't think you could overstate how important it was for HBO to get it right on the first Westeros spinoff that they did post-Game of Thrones, so not doing The Long Night and actually going ahead and doing House of the Dragon and taking it seriously and working close with George may have actually been a complete franchise-saving move from HBO. Also, just since I'm not sure if I'm going to have like an entire video about it or not, the trailers so far for Season 2 definitely have me really excited, and I'd love to hear what you guys think of them down in the comments. The next thing I'd like to talk about quickly is the Dunkin' Egg series that we're going to be getting, because this is one that also has me very excited. For those of you who may not know, Dunkin' Egg is a series of novellas that George has written the first three of and has a lot of them planned. Now, there are a lot of different stories that George has planned, and I think he had a full number for like how many novellas he had planned, but I think recently he might have even said something like he's thought of a few more ideas along the way, so the count might have gone up a little bit in his head. Now, just based on my comments and generally being on the internet, I'd say I'm a little bit more optimistic than the average person is towards George actually finishing the main series. I do think he could get it done but I am pretty much a skeptic on him getting that done and getting all of the Dunkin' Egg novellas written. This is why the combination of the news that HBO is working so closely now with George R. R. Martin and the fact that they're making a Dunkin' Egg series has me so excited, because they can basically do, in my opinion, what they're doing with Fire and Blood, and we can potentially get the full Dunkin' Egg story. Because for those of you who don't know, all of House of the Dragon is just based off of a history book that George R. R. Martin has written, so... The fact that they can take a few pages of history and turn it into a compelling portion of a TV show, in my opinion, is a good sign that they can do the same thing with Dunkin' Egg. If they can basically get George to just write out his couple-page summary of each of the planned Dunkin' Egg stories, then he can maybe get to them in the future, but in the meantime, they can adapt them well to the television screen. The fact that they're making this Dunkin' Egg series means that if it goes well and it's well-received and constantly gets renewed until the finish, we actually might get the entire story of Dunkin' Egg as George originally envisioned it. At least most of the details. Obviously I would love if he can also finish the novellas, but at the same time, you know, the TV series will probably be pretty awesome, and getting to see what George had in mind, at least on that basic level, is something that I really look forward to. 
There are a lot of people within the A Song of Ice and Fire fandom who have the Dunkin' Egg series as their favorite stuff that George has written, so I think that if they do this right, and if we know that they're working right alongside George to get his outline for future stories, there are going to be a ton of people who are really interested in seeing the Dunkin' Egg series and seeing where everything goes. So for real HBO, make sure you're working closely with George Martin, pay him whatever it takes to outline the entire Dunkin' Egg story as he currently sees it in his head, and just follow that, try and adapt it to the best of your abilities, and people are going to care. If they know that this comes from George, and if it's handled well, you're going to have a hit series on your hands with Dunkin' Egg. The next thing that I want to quickly talk about is the fact that they also seem to be going forward with some version of the Aegon's Conquest story. I say some version because The Dragon Demands has put out a couple videos talking about it and pointed out that it may be a movie instead of a series, which is what many people expected when it was first announced. I think the idea of doing it as a movie does make some sense, and it would possibly be a first movie in a series of movies, or possibly be a movie that is then followed by a little mini-series. The reason for this, and I don't think this is too much of a spoiler to say, is that Dorne isn't conquered by the Conqueror right away along with all the other kingdoms. It actually outlasts it, and there's a whole big separate war with Dorne. I would definitely be in favor of either route, I do just really hope that we get to see some of the stuff that happens after the conquest as well, right? Whether it's a series of movies, or whether it's a movie followed by a miniseries, or whether it's, you know, a couple different seasons of a series. The reason that I'm so excited to see potentially what happens after the conquest is because of a few fan theories, or should I say questions, that fans have around things that happen shortly after the conquest is complete. I did say I wouldn't go into too many spoilers here, so I'll just say, for those of you who know in the fandom, I'm referring to the questions around Aegon's children, as well as the questions around a specific letter that was sent to the Conqueror by Dorne, and just everything that surrounds that letter. Both of those topics are on my to-do list for something to cover eventually, so if you want me to go into more detail about that, it will happen at some point, just make sure you hit that subscribe button. The main point for this video, though, is that Aegon's Conquest and the surrounding events, whether it's a movie or a series, is something that I think is a good choice by HBO for something to make some content about. So, definitely I'd say 4 for 4 based on all of the things that we've covered so far in this video. The thing that I would say makes them 5 for 5 is the fact that they are not going to be making the Jon Snow show. For those of you who don't know, this was basically the planned potential sequel to A Game of Thrones, and it seemed like it was mostly Kit Harington's idea and he was the one kind of spearheading the whole project. I know he had talked to George a little bit, but it doesn't seem like George was heavily involved, and I'm not entirely sure how involved most of HBO was either. The reason that I think it was a good idea to not go forward with this is basically because it would have felt like just a season 9 to the end of Game of Thrones, and I really do think too much damage had been done to the story by that point to possibly salvage it. It went deeper than just the rushed nature of the final few seasons, the magic was removed from the story, the themes were removed from the story, there were so many things that were just taken out that are being built up in the books that I don't think a sequel series would have been a satisfying thing to watch. If you would have asked me about this right after Game of Thrones ended, I would have probably been more open to the idea, but the more I've dug back into the books and the more I've recognized all of the things that I think George is setting up that they just took out of the television show, I really don't think it would have ever worked. And if you want to find out more about that and what I think they removed from the show at the end, well, you'll have to just check out my videos if you haven't seen them. I'm not going to go into like a 15 minute long rant right now about how much they messed up the end of the series. But basically they took out a lot of the magical elements, and I think that that really is the thing that screwed them over in the end. I really do think that with everything that was done in the final seasons of Game of Thrones, the only real hope that they have for anything that resembles George R. R. Martin's idea of Westeros is to stick to prequels, and not to do any sequels to that version of Game of Thrones. Now I say that version of Game of Thrones because it's time to talk about what I see as HBO's potential master plan for Westeros. Let's say that we get the finish of House of the Dragon and all of the seasons maintain this level of quality, it's a very good series at the end. Then let's say we get, you know, Dunkin' Egg and that goes throughout the entirety of all of the planned Dunkin' Egg stories and people like that and that's pretty good. At some point we get the Aegon the Conqueror movie and or series, and potentially another movie or a couple other movies following that. If they handle all of these things well, the appetite for Westerosi content is still going to be pretty high and we're going to be in the early to mid 2030s. 
at that point, we still have the potential for them to do other periods in history, potentially even Robert's Rebellion, which I know many people would love to see put on screen. At this point, the sixth book of the series should probably be out, and the seventh book might even be out by the mid-2030s, and I think that it probably will be. If not, they will also obviously be working close enough with George R. R. Martin that they could hopefully have him outline where everything's gonna go in greater detail, and HBO should still be in possession of any of the notes that he gave to D&D about how the original series was supposed to end. All of these things together means that, in my opinion, if HBO can nail all of these series that they're working on until the mid-2030s, we are going to be entering prime reboot territory for a new and better version of Game of Thrones. Now, I know that may sound a little bit crazy given that we aren't that far away from the end of the original Game of Thrones, but if you think about it, 2035 would be a solid 24 years since Season 1 of Game of Thrones aired. We just got an Avatar reboot 19 years after the original series debuted. Season 1 of the Avatar reboot obviously came in 2024 when the original Season 1 was 2005. They've rebooted countless Disney movies from our childhood on about a 20-year cycle, and I know both of those were like going from animation to live action, which is a little bit different, but honestly, if there's money to be made, it just kind of proves that they're willing to reboot something after about 20 years. In addition to that, we're apparently going to be getting a Harry Potter reboot at some point, even though the original movie series for that came out about 20 years ago, so again, right in that time window. And I don't think anyone really thought that the Harry Potter movies were a complete train wreck, like if you liked the books, you probably at least thought the movies were solid, whereas Game of Thrones, a lot of people really, really hated the way that it ended. We had people signing a petition asking them to redo the ending season right after the series ended, so if there was anything that was primed for a solid reboot that takes it seriously and does everything right, it's probably going to be Game of Thrones. In addition to this, there are many advantages for a potential rebooted Game of Thrones that I think could help it avoid some of the mistakes that the original ended up making. I already talked about how the book series will either be done or be much closer to being done than it was during the filming of the original, but in addition to that I think it would be much easier to establish a lot of the magic that they left out of the original series just purely because people will understand the world that they're getting into much more than they did when you were first airing season 1 of the original series. I can almost sympathize with the idea that during Season 1 they couldn't go too heavy on a lot of the magic because they were trying to get a casual audience invested in the series. They definitely needed to start introducing these elements and building them up over the course of the series, and if you've read the books you know that that's what George R. R. Martin did as well. He didn't just like come out right away in the beginning and just drop a bunch of magic on your head. You didn't even really find out until the fifth book for sure that weirwoods drink up blood and that their sap seems to be literally just frozen blood. It's in book five when Asha Greyjoy gets her first close-up look at a weirwood and she says no that's literally frozen blood right there. And, of course, we get at the end of Bran's chapters in Dance with Dragons his, like, vision where he's wed to the trees, and when he's looking through the eyes of the trees and someone's sacrificed in front of them, the line is, Brandon Stark could taste the blood. In addition to this, there's a Davos chapter where they talk about stringing entrails up in the weirwood trees, and we didn't get any of that in the television show, and on some level it does kind of make a bit of sense that it would have been hard to introduce when people had never heard of a weirwood before. That's not a problem that you're going to have if you're trying to reboot this series 10 years from now. Everyone's going to know what a Weirwood is, everyone's going to be very well aware of what's going on and be familiar with the universe. This is going to allow them to potentially go into more details and establish more of the magic than they did in the original series. One of the other things that was definitely an advantage of the original series was how much the surprise and the shock of what would happen next was something that people were tuning in for. Admittedly, this is something that will be lost in a reboot, but at the same time, you could sort of turn certain parts of this to your advantage when you just don't have to worry about that element of surprise and completely shocking the audience. Like, I'm sure a lot of people remember the fact that right before Season 8 was coming out, in the hype and build-up to that, there was a betting market for who would end up on the Iron Throne, and, like, they had a bunch of options, and one of the options was Bran, and then, like, as time went on, more and more money just started getting piled on to Bran Stark to the point where, at the end, like, he was the betting favorite before the season even started, so, like... It was one of those weird things where it basically completely spoiled what was going on because enough people knew that they were able to bet on it. 
that was just one example of how like the crazy amounts of hype around this series was sort of hurting the product itself because like if you were a super fan and you were following game of thrones season eight you probably saw articles about that and on some level or another a lot of people had a pretty solid idea that bran may actually end up on the throne so if you're going into a reboot, sure there will be some people who will have no idea what's going on, but I think the general viewing audience won't be sitting there for shock value the way they were for the original series, and therefore you won't have to worry about completely shocking people, you can focus on just telling the entire story the best way possible, and the people who are tuning in are going to be tuning in for a well-told story. The other thing that I think would be an advantage for a reboot is the fact that you're now fully aware that people will be invested and that this show will do well, and so as a network you can plan out like, okay, we're gonna plan to run this thing all the way through to the end. There's no chance it's gonna be cancelled after season one, we don't have to worry about any of that. If you know that people are going to be invested, you can plan out the entire series from the beginning, you can be fully prepared to expand the cast of characters when the middle books of the series come in, right? When you've got the Ironborn coming in and the Dorn plotline coming in, you can prepare to do that stuff right, instead of just sort of going halfway with it and hoping the audience likes it, and then when the audience doesn't, you just sort of cut the Sand Snakes plot and you shorten up the Ironborn plot. Like, instead, you can just go all in with the entire thing and assume that you have an invested audience. And just one other thing that I think was sort of an issue for the original series that may still be an issue for the reboot, but again kind of goes back to the fact that people will just know what's going to happen and there won't be as much insane hype around the shock value, you can have things like the actress who plays Catelyn actually contracted to come back and also be Lady Stoneheart. I remember in the lead up to the season where Lady Stoneheart should have appeared, many people were looking out to see if Michelle Fairley was cast in any of the episodes or credited anywhere, and she wasn't, and many people were like, oh, are they trying to hide it somehow? And they had, like, legal obligations to, like, list who was casted for what and things like that. So they were like, oh, is some other actress gonna play Stoneheart? And it turns out, like, no. In the end, there just was no Lady Stoneheart. The same thing happened with Kit Harrington being cast in the season after Jon Snow was supposed to be dead when they left that as sort of a season-ending cliffhanger. So, like, that was definitely a problem for the original series that they just sort of had to deal with, and it will potentially be a problem for a reboot as well, but again, when the entire point of a reboot would be telling the story well and doing it correctly, I think you could get around a lot of that because it won't be all about the shock factor in quite the same way that the original was. So for many reasons, from the fact that the books should either be done or very close to done at that point, and if HBO does their job right, they'll have many people who are still interested in Westeros in 10 years, I would say that's the perfect time to think about a reboot. So basically, if they do want to set this up perfectly, what I would say that they should do is basically what they've been doing. Focus entirely on prequels, no sequels, and just loosely connect it to the original Game of Thrones. Don't, like, ever fully, like, commit to it being in the exact same universe. So basically what I mean by that is just start establishing the lore and the magic that the original series left out, make sure that that's worked into your world correctly, and you know you can tie it to the original series in little ways in the way that they sort of have already with House of the Dragon. The perfect examples of this in my opinion are the fact that you have the dagger from the original series making an appearance in House of the Dragon and being important, so people who want to connect it to the original series and really enjoyed that, they can do that but also you have the Iron Throne there, and it looks basically the same as the original series, but it also looks much more lore-appropriate with all of the extra swords added around it. Doing it this way basically allows people to connect it to the original series in their head if they want to, they can just be like, oh, they must have taken away some of the swords by the time that Robert Baratheon is sitting the throne. It essentially keeps it plausible that this is all taking place in the same universe if they never do a reboot, but if it's all successful for the next 10 years or so, they can turn around pretty easily and say, nope, actually we're going to reboot the original and it's actually been all build up to that cinematic universe. Then they buy themselves another decade of content by doing Game of Thrones properly and having all of the themes and all of the magic and all of the characters actually in the show, and then after that, if they want to go into sequels, then they can do so. Now, obviously, that's just an idea out of my head. I'm just kind of making up what I would do here. But as a fan, that's what I would want them to do with Westeros, build up to a proper reboot that actually takes everything seriously and sticks the landing. And if you're a major network who owns the rights to Westeros and wants to make the most money out of this, that also seems like it's the best option. 
So let me know what you think of all that down in the comments. Do you think this would be a good master plan for HBO, and do you think there's any potential that this is the direction they'll go? Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back with something else very soon.